Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Welcome all of you to this live program at Orthopedic Principles. Today, our guest of honor is Dr. Robert Dunbar from the Harborview Medical Center, Seattle, United States. Dr. Dunbar grew up in Boston, Massachusetts, and later he worked as a Peace Corps volunteer in Burkina Faso from 1985 to 1987, teaching middle school math and English as a second language. And then he returned back to the US and pursued his medicine in Georgetown University School of Medicine on the US Navy scholarship. Dr. Dunbar then pursued his orthopedic residency at Connell's Hospital for Special Surgery in New York City, finishing it in 1988. 1998. His first job was as an attending in a Navy hospital in Japan, and after that, he was back in the U.S. in Virginia. He then completed his orthopedic trauma fellowship at the Harborview Medical Center in Seattle in 2003, and after completing his military commitment in 2005, he returned to Seattle as an attending at the Harborview Medical Center, where he has been since. He has helped train over 80 fellows and over 150 residents. He has started courses on six continents with the American Academy of Orthopedic Surgeons, the AOE, and the Orthopedic Trauma Association, including three times in India, of which I had the opportunity to listen to him. Today, it's my great honor to introduce you to Dr. Robert Dunbar from the Harborview Medical Center, Seattle, United States. Over to you, Dr. Dunbar. Oh, thank you so much. Um, well, it's really a pleasure and a, and a great honor to be able to speak to you today. Uh, I'm still hoping for that invite to a course in Antarctica, and then I'll complete the circuit. Um, so uh, any rate, uh, I'm going to talk today about pilon fractures. Um, and first of all, I want to say greetings from Seattle. Uh, you know, it's a, it's, not, it's a little bit rainy here now. It's not quite as colorful. The colors go from those colors you see there to light and dark gray this time of year. Uh, but it's, uh, it's, uh, it's a great place as well. Uh, so at any rate, um, I just want to let you know my biases uh, I, in terms of pilon fractures. I believe in staged management. Um, I believe in that skeletal integrity aids soft tissue recovery, and I believe in internal fixation when possible. I, I want you to know what I'm up against here at Harborview, and I want you to, we have a significant number or percentage of highly unreliable or unpredictable patients. Uh, we have, as, as you may also, uh, I have, uh, we have a high uh, number of high energy and polytraumatized patients. And we have a lot of patients with one or more relevant comorbidities. Our objectives today uh, to talk about the rationale for stage management of pilon fractures, my rationale for choosing a surgical, surgical approach or approaches, and then the rationale for a fracture fixation construct. Pilons are a life-changing injury. Many patients can't return to the previous employment. 71% couldn't single leg stand for 30 seconds. At Any injury. Skeletal instability adds to the soft tissue injury with tenting or penetration of the skin leading to uh, an open fracture, uh, kinking of vessels, or even bone loss in open fractures. Many will have not just fractures of the bone, of course, but fractures of cartilage with multiple fracture lines, impaction, potential for cartilage death, and propensity for arthrosis. The good news is that the bony injury is actually easily defined, whether it's through x-rays, uh, two-dimensional uh, multi-axial uh, CTs, or even three-dimensional CT scanning that Tornetta showed long ago uh, was helpful in planning surgeries. However, the soft tissue envelope is far less uh, easily defined. It's often evolving. It's difficult to quantify. You can't, it's very, there, there are good classification systems for the bony injuries, not nearly so much for the soft tissue injury. And it's difficult to assess recovery of the soft tissue injury as well. Plus the soft tissues don't recover nearly as well as the bones either. The muscles become fibrotic, tendons adherent, 
the joint uh, may fill up with uh, arthrofibrotic tissue uh, and they're not, it's not as redundant. The joints don't move as well. They don't bathe the cartilage as well, which uh, also leads towards arthrosis. So what are our goals? Uh, well, uh, we want to return to function uh, with a healed, well-aligned, reduced mobile joint while avoiding catastrophic complications with no wound problems and no infection. Despite the uh, glowing uh, or at least hopeful uh, reports from Rudy and Algauer uh, at the end of the 70s, many reports uh, of disasters occurred uh, here, at least here in the United States in the uh, 80s and 90s, uh, which led to folks to lead to a more nihilistic approach, uh, not doing as much open uh, procedures, looking towards things like external fixation with limited internal fixation uh, of the articular surface. Uh, but, you know, this is, uh, as we realize, ligament ataxis really does not work well for impacted uh, tissues. You can imagine that may, while we may have uh, eliminated some of the most catastrophic uh, uh, complications, we're really not uh, restoring the articular surface, and uh, we are uh, predisposing our patients to uh, arthrosis in that regard. So towards the end of the uh, 19th, 20th century, uh, two teams out of Florida, Mike Surkin and then Dean Cole, uh, used standard, uh, used uh, spanning uh, external fixation to get things out to length. They had good re results. You can see here, they're both medial frames with the proximal pins, well out of the way of anticipated sites of incisions and implants. We tend to use a, 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 a transcalcaneal pin to uh, manage uh, both medial and laterally uh, now, uh, but a medial frame in the setting with a, a stable lateral column is fine as well. Uh, this uh, gives us the whole span, scan, plan uh, paradigm where we fix the fibula, uh, external fixation from the tibia to foot, either that milta, medial or delta frame, getting our CT scanning, but more out to length and more aligned. And then we uh, do our surgical planning and we actually wait. I wish there was a, something that rhymed with scan, span, and plan uh, that meant waiting, but uh, we haven't come up with that yet. And then if you're not the one who's going to do stage two, uh, it's time to get a referral as well. So uh, because, it, you know, we're not going to do this right away because whether you're on the road or you're in the orthopedic trauma clinic, red means stop. So when do, when do you go? Well, when you start to see re-epithelialization after a fracture blister, you see some wrinkling of the skin. So the skin starts to look at like the birthday balloon that's about a week after the birthday and things are starting to wrinkle up. This gives us some indication uh, that this might be time to proceed with stage two. Now, there are reports uh, of uh, doing early definitive surgery. The guys just north of us in Vancouver, British Columbia, Canada, uh, reported on that, uh, as have the guys at Harvard uh, early, just earlier this year. Um, but they, all of these studies had certain exclusions. Uh, you know, so there's a little bit of a, a selection bias where, the, you know, with worse soft tissue injury, open fractures, and then they noted they all noted they had more problems with patients with diabetes, psych issues, alcohol abuse, and neuropathy. Not surprising, right? Not surprising at all that uh, these would lead to more problems. And and you know the rationale for early definitive surgery is quite good. I mean, I, like it's it, the the. Uh, in, 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 to a certain extent. The fragments are mobile, the hematoma is liquid, the reduction is probably easier. You know, look at this uh, picture on the right, this woody fibrotic looking leg after a few uh, weeks of uh, external fixation. There's no cost or risk of the X fix, there's less surgery, maybe this is a little bit sooner to recovery. But is it that simple? Like how well can we predict the development of soft tissue problems? As I said earlier, it's really hard to assess uh, the uh, soft tissue injury, to quantify it, to quantify the recovery, uh, to know the patients well enough, to know who is reliable, uh, what their protoplasm is like. And we don't do a great job of being able to see uh, into the future that well on these things. So my take on definitive surgery is it's probably appropriate for select lower energy injuries, more torsional, malleolar, 
uh, or this more torsional one here, rather than something uh, higher energy. Maybe if it happened just moments ago, you have that window of opportunity that the guys from Vancouver talk about. And if you have a reliable patient with good physiology that you trust, maybe that's a good thing to do. It's really an experienced surgeon who really should make this decision. And what happens if you guess wrong? Uh, if you guess wrong, well, that's a lot of misery for the patient. So uh, I, I really like, uh, you know, uh, getting the fibula fixed out, getting this externally fixed. If you look at this peel on that's open posteriorly, these are particularly bad actors. It's hard to even see what's going on, but you fix the fibula and put an external fixer on. This starts to look like something we may be able to manage more appropriately, right? So uh, what else is good about fixing the fibula? Well, a fixed bone is probably the best splint. It helps you get the talus underneath the tibia because of its ligamentous attachments. Uh, it helps restore the soft tissues to length, which helps with their recovery. And you may have better soft tissues laterally than the thin soft tissue envelope on the medial side. We like to put our incisions for the fibula sort of posterior laterally so it stays out of the way of a potential anterior lateral approach or if we need to get behind to get to the Volkman. Uh, and it may really be our only guide to the length of the tibia, right? Uh, so uh, the other thing to remember is that because of those uh, ligamentous attachments from the distal fragment of the fibula uh, through the uh, 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 to the Volkman and the Chaput fragments. If you get the fibula right, uh, you, that helps with uh, tethering and helping with an indirect reduction of those uh, fragments of the pilon fracture. If that sits way short or is fixed short or inappropriately, that may make your next uh, part of the pilon reconstruction very difficult. So the argument against fixing the fibula uh, in stage one is like, well, could this add to more soft tissue injury? Sure, in, in, if you have to assess that going into it. If you're fixed uh, laterally and if you have bone loss medial, does that favor varus collapse? Um, is having a short fibula not a problematic long-term? Well, if you talk to my foot and ankle colleagues, they say it's a significant problem uh, uh, biomechanically. And uh, if we've made that incision, do we like reopening a wound to get to the posterior lateral approach to fix the Volkman if we have to? So I, I think one thing I would say about the fibula is if you're gonna do it, you gotta do it right. It's just like uh, doing a, a both bone forearm fracture. If you get the first one wrong, it's gonna be very difficult to get the second one right. So a fibula malreduction in stage one may complicate stage two reconstruction. You can see a varus, Fibula here is pushing the talus medial. It's gonna be very hard to get the tibia right. Not just the coronal plane, it can be the sagittal plane problems as well can lead to, and, and you gotta get the rotation of the fibula right as well. So when should we not fix the fibula in stage one? Well, if you have unstable patients, certainly that should wait. It's life over limb, right? If you have a rapidly evolving soft tissue envelope, that should wait. Uh, if your fracture is likely to require a posterior approach to the Volkman, then uh, maybe we do that all at once rather than uh, putting a zipper on the wound and opening it back up uh, to do that twice. And if you're not the one doing stage two, then maybe you'll leave that to the person uh, taking care of that so you don't commit them to that or use an incision they might not have used, right? So what can we do to get the edge on these sometimes terrible fractures? Well, uh, Sometimes uh, if you have a simple fibula pattern, you can get away without even having to make a fibula incision. You can do closed or percutaneous uh, reduction fixation with intermedially fixation of the fibula during your X fix or stage one. So well, you can use a cannulated or not cannulated screw for this and then come back later and fix this when the soft tissues are appropriate. Now we, haven't, we don't even haven't even used a fibular incision. There are also, you can use uh, chance pins or, or Steinman pins or a guide wire for intramedullary nailing. Or there's even uh, uh, implants designed for these, but I don't have any experience with that, but there's like an interlocking nail for the fibula. You can also take advantage of open wounds. This was a case from not uh, just a couple months ago. Uh, There's an open uh, medial pilon, it's valgus pilon with an open wound. We debrided the open wound. The medial fragment kept, excuse me, the distal end of the proximal fragment kept wanting to tent the skin. And the only way I could really make this behave well was to put this 2 0 straight plate with these very short unicortical 2.4 millimeter cortical screws. 
uh, to hold that in place. It was the tension failure, so it's a simple pattern. And this obviates the need for me to come back and do this or open that medial wound later. Uh, I you know, need a stout implant anterior laterally, uh, but you can see that this controls this very nicely and it's so low profile, it's not tenting those traumatized uh, medial soft tissues. You can also upgrade C-type fractures to uh, B-type fractures. We noticed uh, about uh, uh, 15 years ago that about 10% of our pylons had an extension of the shaft. And this was typically attached to the Volkman fragment, but not always, sometimes it's attached to the medial malleolus. Uh, and we could, uh, we could uh, take care of this because uh, it was proximal to the vulnerable soft tissues. So uh, we could do a small posterior medial approach in this particular instance uh, and uh, to use either independent lag screws or a small uh, plate uh, and fix that. Now it's starting to look like something we can build to with changes from a C type, a 43C, uh, complete articular injury to a 43B or partial articular injury, you know, B meaning part of the articular surface is attached to the shaft, right? And then we come back and fix that when it's a, soft tissues allow. Okay, well, in terms of our approaches now, there's lots of different approaches to get to the tibial and the fibular components of the pilon, and you have to decide uh, how you're going to get to that. Um, uh, and what uh, approach or approaches you're going to use. And how do you decide that? Well, uh, the main way we do that is uh, first uh, uh, the fracture pattern and then uh, the condition of the soft tissues. Um, so the fracture pattern in the coronal plane, uh, we've got a tension failure fibula or varus pilon, okay? Uh, then in the middle here, we have a valgus type uh, pilon. You just saw that uh, x-ray uh, compression failure. Fibula. Or you can have no fibula fraction. It's just direct axial load. And you know what happens is we, what we really want is an implant on the concave side of that fracture. It's, on the compression side, there's usually a more comminution as opposed to simple tension failure. So we want an implant uh, that will buttress that on the medial side. We still typically fix a fibula with this varus pilon, but it's usually a medial buttress. And that may favor an anterior medial approach. With the valgus pilon, it's the reverse, right? We want to fix the fibula. We want to fix the lateral side on that concave and buttress that side. Uh, and that may favor an anterior lateral approach. With an intact fibula, it really de depends on the soft tissues and the CT as to see where we got to get our work done. In the sagittal plane, uh, you know, posterior B and C type fracture dislocations typically require a posterior approach, either posterior medial or posterior lateral, depending on the CT uh, and other imaging. And then anterior B and C type fracture dislocations uh, need some anterior approach, uh, e usually either an anterior lateral or anterior medial. Again, um, depending on what the other imaging shows. This one has an extension up into the shaft, uh, which is probably best addressed through a more extensional approach, like an anterior medial approach. Another thing to consider regarding the fracture pattern is the size of the chaput fragment, or, or better, where the medial probably favor a direct anterior. You can probably do either approach. And then if it's more lateral, uh, then you're uh, probably going to use an anterior lateral approach. Another thing to think about is why we need to get in there at all is so that you can get to your areas of articular impaction. How are we going to access those? We need to get to those areas of impaction. And depending on where they are, that's what, how you're going to decide what approach you're going to use, right? Another thing to look at is we we noticed, uh, or I noticed uh, a couple of times when I was doing fractures, fixing pilon fractures, that I would would see the one of the posterior medial tendons within the fracture itself, uh, and we looked at ours. We found this happened about ten percent of the time. Um, and uh, John Eastman was uh, one of our fellows in 2012. Uh, so it, this may require you to do a separate posterior medial approach. As in this, you can see the posterior tibial tendon is actually caught within uh, the, between the posterior edge of the medial malleolus and the medial edge of the Volkman fragment. And you have to retract that out and then close the door of the, reduce and close the door of the fracture so that can't go back in there. Uh, so that may decide for you what approaches you need. 
And at the end of the day, you know, what can the soft tissues tolerate? I mean, this is, you know, it, it may, all the fracture pattern stuff is important, but if the soft tissues uh, can't handle these things, and if you get somebody with a bad injury and bad protoplasm, this is going to increase the risk of complications. And if that's the case, I'm more likely to use an anterior lateral than an anterior medial approach if it's a poor protoplasm. Uh, Maybe we're going to limited goals, fewer added approaches, percutaneous techniques, and maybe using an adjunctive X fix with limited fixation internally. Again, what can the soft tissues tolerate? If you had a previously open medial wound, that may favor an anterior lateral approach. Poor lateral soft tissues may favor an anterior medial approach. And then patient particulars like age and physiology. Age itself is probably, chronology is probably less important than physiology. I have a lot of patients who are actually probably act older than they uh, actually are. And then you have to think about the different comorbidities that may relate to their ability to uh, heal uh, like diabetes, peripheral vascular disease, and any, any type of immunosuppression, and whether they're able to uh, comply with your recommendations. Uh, you know, patients who have psychological issues may not be able uh, to do so. And then if they're on drugs uh, or, or have an alcohol problem, that may be the same thing. So first case, 37-year-old uh, guy, 15-foot uh, fall from a ladder. He's a very big guy, 190 centimeters uh, in height. That's 6'3 here. He's so over 300 pounds and almost 150 kilos. Uh, he has a little bit of hypertension. He's a non-smoker. Works as a program, uh, computer programmer. Uh, so here's the AP, and these are full images. You can see that he's significantly shortened, okay? The chaput fragment is uh, uh, effectively dislocated or the talus has pounded its way up. Actually found uh, bits of articular cartilage almost up at the tip of the medial malleolar fragment when we did this. Uh, so you gotta think about uh, how these, this, this injury on the left, this uh, trimal on the left versus what we're looking at here. Uh, this is a much more axial injury in a very big guy who fell 15 feet. So you got to think about the soft tissues, right? His wife is an orthopedic uh, nurse in a nearby community hospital, and she was pushing for uh, immediate uh, uh, ORIF, uh, but we chose uh, to go with stage treatment. Uh, and what are our goals here? Well, we get our uh, tibial pins up out of the way of anticipated sites of incisions and implants. Okay, we got to get the, the, the talus out from its area of impaction and all the way uh, uh, down and uh, get, essentially get the talus under the tibia, I guess, and protect all the soft tissues, uh, right? So then we get our CT scan and you can see the chaput fragment is so displaced it's sideways, right? You can also see some articular uh, impaction centrally in the image on the left. So this is starting to give us some idea, not a simple pattern posterior medially as well, may not need a separate approach there. Okay, um, with our sagittals, you can see the articular, uh, piece of the articular surface uh, impacted there. And then in the central image, uh, but this extends up in the shaft. So we probably want something a little bit more extensile. The anterior lateral approach is not particularly extensile. Uh, so uh, we're going to go with an anterior medial approach, right? Uh, and uh, here's the anterior medial approach. You can either, we like the vertical limb, just lateral to the crest, and then you can uh, follow the medial edge of the anterior tibialis, or you can make a more acute or about 60, 70 degree turn and wind up uh, just a centimeter distal to the anterior colliculus. Here we are, the deep incision is actually uh, medial to the uh, anterior tib. You don't want to see the tendon itself, just its sheath. Um, these anterior medial approaches are good for a large chaput fragment. Uh, if you have extension in the shaft because it's extensile, you have to do a lot of work medially. If your fibula incision is uh, too anterior, if you get poor lateral soft tissues, that favors an anterior medial approach as well. So here we are, we're coming down. You can see we've exposed nicely. We're swept all the extensors and the anterior neurovascular bundle uh, uh, laterally. Uh, we then have uh, room for our clamps and provisional and uh, K-wires, and we can place our implants. You know, we start up top, work from the shaft uh, down. 
Uh, he did have an extension up into the shaft, but his soft tissues hadn't favored us doing that early. So we had to clean out that fracture uh, and uh, clamp that and lag it together. And here we are stabilizing the articular surface to the shaft. Um, and here are our final radiographs. Uh, here's how we close this. We place all the sutures in, uh, usually O or 2O uh, vicryl or, or proline, uh, in, uh, and uh, bring this all together as once using force distribution, uh, bring tying using bring them all together and then cutting them, excuse me, and then tying them one at a time so there's no tension on any of them. Uh, then we cut these and then we do the same thing for the skin, placing all the sutures before tying any of them and using the Algar modification of the Donati suture. Here's our final product. Three months, he did have a slight change in his uh, Chaput fragment. Uh, we chose not to pursue that. Uh, and at nine months, he had, uh, you know, not a lot of dorsiflexion, but decent plantar flexion, no pain. He's now back at work. Again, he works uh, as a computer programmer. He says his first few uh, steps are tight, but he's still improving. He does show some signs of uh, arthrosis. Okay, here's another one. We got a 33 year old woman. She was a pedestrian struck by an auto. This is more of a valgus uh, pattern. It's open. Uh, it's uh, five, six centimeters uh, medially, as you'd expect. Uh, she's closed, reduced, and splinted. She got an IND. You can see my thumb in the medial image pushing the shaft over. It wants to come out. Um, we've got, again, our pins are proximal from anticipated sites of incisions and implants. Get a transcalcaneal pin, a cuneiform uh, pin with a four by 150 millimeter shans pin to hold the foot in neutral dorsiflexion so we don't get an Aquinas contracture. After uh, spamming X fix and the IND, uh, we then uh, uh, fix our fibula. We fix this uh, distally and then drag the plate and the distal segment uh, distally and fix this to regain our length. Uh, you can see here, I think initially our uh, fibula reduction looks a little maybe externally rotated based on the paper uh, out of, uh, from, by Chang and injury last year. Uh, we reduced uh, that, re-reduced that and got it a little better. Look at our CT scan, very small should put fragment, not much to do medially. Okay, and uh, so we then uh, proceed uh, with an anterior lateral approach, which is an incision in line with the fourth metatarsal, superficial perineal nerve is located and protected. I usually try to tuck this medially, mobilizing it, uh, bring it medially. We incise the retinacula, retract our extensors in the anterior nerve vascular bundle medially. Uh, this is good for smaller chaput fragments and when you have to do a lot of work laterally or if your medial soft tissues are poor, or if the patient's not good protoplasm. So we hold on to the ATFL, swing open the chaput to enter the fracture. Okay, we can put a distractor into the uh, tailor neck. And we typically work from posterior to medial, excuse me, posterior to anteriorly. Uh, we derotate the uh, Volkman fragment down into position, typically pin it to the fibula. We reduce our central impaction after we reduce the Volkman to the medial malleolus. And then we move to reducing the, uh, ant the medial malleolus to the uh, anterior lateral chaput fragment, closing now the door of the chaput uh, with provisional fixation. And then we bring this all, uh, attach this all to the articular block. So uh, we reduced our uh, articular block here. We've added uh, both anterior lateral implant and a small rim plate to support our articular surface better. Uh, because of our poor medial soft tissues, we did a single uh, medial malleolar uh, screw uh, to uh, stabilize the medial edge of uh, that component. This bicortical medial malleolar uh, didn't really feel comfortable placing a medial plate because of her poor soft tissues. Uh, so here she is at three months, uh, starting to heal up. And at seven months, uh, she still has a little bit of decreased sensation in the superficial perineal nerve. She has not returned to work, uh, but she does report having walked for miles at Disneyland with her kids a couple of days. So I think she's doing okay. Um, okay, so uh, got uh, now uh, another case. This is a 26 year old male. Is in a motor vehicle collision. Uh, this is a varus uh, pilon. You can see the simpler tension failure um, uh, fibula fracture. He does have fracture blisters. He's got a history of alcohol abuse. Uh, we may want to be 
trying to uh, be mindful of uh, the potential complications in folks with ETOH abuse. Uh, that can also be a surrogate for malnutrition, not always, uh, but it's something to think about, certainly uh, unreliability. So we start with intermedullary fixation of the fibula, and we did just a small approach uh, to get our reduction of that and used a, a, a cannulated screw there put our ankle span in external fixation. Again, the pins up out of the way of anticipated sites of incisions and implants. Uh, again, the cuneiform pin, looking at our CT scan, he's got a larger chaput uh, fragment. So that exit point is relatively anterior medial and a varus pilon really favors anterior medial approach. Uh, but I, I went down on the other side. I, I thought, I, so you can see my thumb on the first image and I'm sort of pushing over the medial malleus uh, uh, and I, this looks somewhat reduced, and I, I think that I thought that it would be more prudent uh, because the patient's no, poor medial soft tissues and his known history of alcohol to, to use a percutaneous approach for the medial column and then use a, an anterior lateral approach to do our main work. So that's what we did. Uh, so uh, we buttressed the medial side percutaneously and just made really an, a, just a two centimeter incision, incision distal to the medial malleolus and then just holes for uh, screw fixation. Uh, we then uh, reduced the joint uh, from the anterior lateral, placed an anterior lateral plate. Here are our OR finals. Uh, he did have a non-operative, a, a calcaneal fracture that we chose to treat non-operatively. Post-operatively, these guys get nerve blocks. Uh, uh, from our anesthetic colleagues. They get a drain, they're splinted, a plaster splint in neutral, uh, typically for one to two weeks. You get 24 hours of antibiotics, elevation, and we start them. As soon as we take them out of the splint, we start them with early motion of the, the tibia, tailor, sub -tailor joint, and toe mobilization, and it's 12 weeks non-weight bearing. So here he is at three months, just starting to weight bear. Six months, he's returned to work, uh, he does real estate, uh, he also has a little bit of paresthesias in the SPN, his torso flexion is 10 and plantar flexion is 40 degrees and is healed. So can we reduce the joint from the front? Do we need a posterior approach? Well, I, we try really hard not to add approaches if we can. We try, uh, most fractures are approached from the front, either from an anterior lateral or an anterior medial approach. As you can see in these images, we can bring the Volkman down into position uh, after we uh, enter the fracture, but sometimes you can't do that, right? So get this 33 year old guy, fell 20 feet, he's an isolated peel, a lot of shortening, right? No fibula fracture, uh, it's closed, he's neurovascularly intact, but this is a high energy injury. We're gonna do stage management of this. Uh, he's splinted here. You can see the Volkman fragment is, just looks way off. It's almost rotated, you know, four, 50 plus degrees from where it should be. Um, he's got an external fixer and you can still see the impaction all through. And, you know, most of the time I have to do a spanning external fixation, particularly if they don't have a fibula fracture. Uh, this is starting to look like an ankle, uh, but this one really looks, still looks all jumbled up uh, and uh, uh, really uh, is a very uh, severely commented fraction. So at any rate, uh, the, the CT scan uh, it's so displaced, particularly on the axles, it's hard to tell what's going on. You can just see that the, the Volkman is uh, rotated uh, so much. Uh, and particularly over on the sagittals on the right side of the image, this is so displaced. I really didn't think I could manage this or stabilize it from the front. I really thought I needed to do this from the back. So we did a prone posterior lateral approach. Uh, obviously, you have to worry, you have to look for your uh, sural. Um, uh, nerve and protect that throughout. Uh, we come behind the fibula and work on uh, 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 posterior to the perineals and retract the FHL immediately. Uh, here we are uh, reducing that fracture and we put nice short screws in because we don't want to block the, the work we have to do more anteriorly. Uh, after we've done this, we flip, close that incision, uh, flip the patient's supine, do an anterior medial approach. Uh, buttress uh, immediately just so we'll have something to work with. He was so displaced immediately, so comminuted. Uh, so we get that uh, into place. And now we can work uh, anteriorly. And now we have to work around the screws and the implant uh, we had from posterior to anterior. Now, you don't have to do this very often, thankfully. So we have to get stay out of the way of the screws. And now we're sending the screws anterior to posteriorly after we've reduced 
uh, the, uh, uh, the rest of the articular surface, the central impaction and the chaput fragment. Here are our finals. It's not perfect, uh, but uh, it's, uh, uh, he, I think he's well corralled. Uh, and at six weeks, uh, he's uh, starting to heal. You can see a little osteopenia from being non-weight bearing. Three months, uh, he's, starting his, he's improving his motion. We're gonna start him on some early motion. Six months, uh, he's essentially healed. And we see him at one year and he uh, had gone back to work as a general handyman. Uh, so there are some patients you just can't trust with any real incision. She's this cachectic, uh, a 63 year old woman smokes more than a pack a day. She admitted to methamphetamine use the day before we fixed her as well. And thankfully, you know, we put her in a spanner uh, just so we could assess. It's not the worst injury in the world. You might go ahead and fix this, but you, you might regret it too. Uh, so this is in the spanner uh, and she's uh, reasonably aligned. It's really not much of a joint injury. You can see here in the lower injury, excuse me, a lower image on the left. Uh, very low fracture, fairly commuted, poor bone stock, unreliable patient. And I just didn't think that putting real incisions on this patient would be prudent. So we did percutaneous fixation of her articular surface with partially threaded uh, uh, screws. Uh, and then we uh, did intermedially fixation of the fibula and then intermedially fixation of the tibia. So we up retrograde with the fibula and integrate with the tibia. And then uh, this keeps us uh, from having uh, incisions that uh, might be problematic in this patient. This is uh, her finals in the operating room and then at three months. And uh, after that, she uh, decided not to show up anymore. Uh, she looked like she was well on her way to union. Um, just a couple more. Uh, got this guy, uh, he had a fall from a second story window. He also had a distal radius fracture. He had a long, uh, extension to the shaft uh, here, but on the lateral view, it looks like his Volkman uh, is widely uh, displaced as well. So this is really uh, a long extension of the shaft that actually attaches to the medial malleolus rather than the Volkman. This is less likely even than the Volkman one. It's splinted. We fix the extension of the shaft, which essentially makes this a, a B-type fracture easier to build to. Uh, and uh, we then get our CT scan. You can see he's still widely off posteriorly. Uh, and uh, we, this one is, is low and so displaced that we thought that he would be better off with a posterior lateral approach as well. Uh, so here we are the, with a, again with a prone posterior lateral. And we uh, supine anterior lateral approach. Uh, with a rim uh, fixation as well to further support the smaller articular fragments. Um, finals in the operating room. You can see the hole in the talus on the right uh, where we place our distractor. Uh, the one in the cuneiform was for the external fixator as was the one in the calc. Here he is at six weeks. It's beginning weight bearing is three months. At six months, and healed it a year. Uh, this is a quick one. Uh, this is a 67 year old man. Uh, he had a motor vi vehicle collision, it was type three open. Uh, he was uh, fixed uh, up, but uh, he, uh, uh, due to his uh, likely the stripping uh, that uh, led to him sl being slow to heal, he ultimately failed uh, and uh, Late hardware failure is the telltale of non-union. Uh, so you got to uh, rule out or, or treat an infection. And you got to think about what we have here, right? Our articular surface has healed. This is really more of a metaphyseal non-union. If this was a fresh fracture with no hardware in it, how might we treat this? Uh, and uh, we started treating these. Justin Haller was uh, uh, a fellow of ours in uh, 2016. He's now uh, at the University of Utah. Uh, and uh, uh, doing great work, uh, publishing a lot and doing, fixing a lot of great fractures. So in any case, we uh, chose to treat this with uh, removal of hardware and, and intermedially nailing. And with five months later, he was uh, effectively healed. So now if you, you know, the, the joint is healed, so it's a, really a metaphyseal non-union. Okay, finally, we've got this 54 year old woman. Uh, you might call this a trimal more than a pilon. Uh, but uh, she is significantly displaced. It's almost half of her articular surface uh, posteriorly. You can see the CT scan on the left. There's a little bit of communication, not much posterior immediately. Um, 
uh, and a large uh, uh, part of her joint. Uh, so she gets a prone ap approach. Here we are reducing this. And again, we buttress this posteriorly, flip her uh, through the same incision, uh, working on the other side of the perineals. We then uh, reduce and fix the fibula as well. Uh, and then we flip her uh, and uh, buttress the medial side through a limited anterior medial approach. Um, here she is at uh, final radiographs and at five months, essentially healed. So um, here's my, the very last one. Uh, this is a little bit uh, different. Uh, this is, uh, it's, uh, it's, this is uh, it's a 59-year-old male. He was in a high-speed motorcycle collision at a liver transplant patient on immunosuppression. He also has diabetes. Uh, he was positive for both meth and uh, cocaine. He's a Jehovah's Witness. He uh, doesn't allow transfusion. And he has a 26 by 10 centimeter wound uh, anteriorly. It's essentially uh, from posterior medial to uh, posterior lateral. And then it tees down the front down to the joint. Uh, I uh, unfortunately didn't have a photo of this. So I have these fancy graphics that I hope you'll appreciate. So this, that's essentially his wound. Um, so my partner uh, uh, ex-fixed this. Uh, I, I'm not sure that this was, uh, it wasn't clear to me that this was reconstructable, uh, but he got a depredement and an ex-fix. Uh, and you can see he's got a simple fibula pattern, significant bone loss. Uh, and when I tried to talk to the plastic surgeons about whether they could uh, put a free flap on this, they essentially laughed me out because this patient just wasn't a credible flap candidate. Uh, so I was trying to think of what we could do. Certainly uh, it looked like uh, 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 below knee or transtubular amputation was uh, potentially in the mix uh, due to his immunocompromise uh, uh, and large wound that wasn't gonna be easily solvable. But uh, what I ultimately chose to do uh, was just to shorten him a bit. I took a, a, about three centimeters out of the fibula um, and then just loosen the X fix pins and then slid him up on it um, and put a, a cement spacer in and to see if we could get that. And we were able to close the wound primarily uh, by, uh, by doing that. Um, and then, uh, so here it was with that, I, I suppose I could have made the fibula cut to favor a little bit more valgus in the, in the fibula. Uh, we brought him back and fixed the uh, him percutaneously and then brought him back a couple months later and bone grafted uh, his uh, 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 defect. Uh, and while he's a couple centimeters short, you know, within five months, he was walking some using a cane. Um, at nine months, he was back on his motorcycle, wore a two centimeter shoe lift, and he was not interested in further procedures. Certainly, you know, there are uh, newer technologies, whether you do a masculet a type uh, or a some sort of lengthening a nail or an elizaroff, um, uh, but uh, that really didn't seem to be the uh, ideal uh, thing for this patient. I think he needed to get his wound closed, uh, which you could uh, do with uh, other things as well. This is what we chose, uh, uh, and it uh, appears to have worked out for him. Uh, in any case, here he is. Last time I saw him at 14 months post, effectively healed. Uh, so in summary, tibial pilon fractures are often high energy injuries, axial load being the characteristic mechanism. The prudent use of stage management may minimize devastating complications. Uh, the surgical approach is determined by fracture pattern, soft tissue conditions, and other patient-specific considerations. And mechanically appropriate fixation strategies favor, but don't guarantee a progression to uneventful union. Thanks very much. Thank you, Dr. Dunbar. Fantastic presentation. I, I mean, I've seen these kind of x-rays because I've been following your work for pretty long, but I'm sure <laughs> this is going to be new for a global audience. I mean, they would have not seen these kind of perfectly anatomically reduced x-rays. And thank you for that. Just a few questions. Yes. Uh, now, some of the, I mean, I've always been intrigued by, I know we put a plate on the medial side and the lateral side as well. Uh, are we going to create a lot of avascular bone in between? A kind of sandwich. Yeah, you know, I I, I do think there uh, is uh, uh, certainly concern uh, for that. Uh, 
I, I do think that uh, if you're just doing an anterior lateral approach, uh, you know, that's a fairly limited approach. It's not extensile. We're working really at the joint and we tend to slide our plates, uh, you know, retrograde submuscularly. So all the proximal fixation on those is done percutaneously. So there's really none taken there. Uh, I think our blue plate special implant or construct would be that plus a percutaneously slid medial approach. Again, like I showed, uh, I didn't show the incisions, but it's really only about a, an incision about uh, that can be dragged wide enough to be able to slide the plate medial to go off a uh, uh, medial support. Uh, now, uh, that doesn't answer the question whether compressing the plate to the bone causes uh, further uh, problems. You could use a locked implant, I suppose. Uh, but I think the concerns are that even with a valgus pilon, we've had va plenty of valgus pilons that when they fail, they fail in varus, right? So just even though, you know, typically and, and intuitively, you think, when things fail, they want to go back to the point of where they were at the moment of injury, right? And if that's the case, it's usually because we didn't support it appropriately on that side. Not always, but uh, but with pilon fractures, ultimately they want to fail into they, a lot of them are going to fail into into varus, and that has to do with the poor bone stock and the stripping and the poor you know and everything else on the, the medial side. Uh, Justin Haller. That uh, the fellow uh, of ours uh, who is now in a, uh, a, 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 at Utah uh, had a paper just uh, last year that uh, actually not fixing the medial side predisposed people to non-union. So I, you know, and that may just be getting the bones, uh, you know, close to one another. It's, it may be the reduction uh, rather than the the uh, than the uh, construct specifically. Um, uh, but certainly, you know, we are mindful of, uh, you know, the, the, the already stripped tissues, right, uh, and trying to be as soft tissue friendly as we can. An anterior medial approach is fairly uh, is extensile. And you saw from the photos, I mean, you, you're, you're, it's widely open. So, you know, you're really hoping that the, the blood, uh, that the tissues are, are, are the bone is still uh, vascularized from the back, right? Uh, you know, the one thing you have going for it is cancellous bone in that metaphyseal area that's more, uh, uh, has more of a propensity to heal than cortical bone. If this was up in the shaft, uh, you'd probably have more of a problem. Thank you for that. And whenever you do these uh, closed pylons, do you like to graft it, bone graft it? Uh, so uh, we typically uh, will use uh, cancellous allograft. Uh, we don't typically use autograft. Uh, you know, I think that's a, it may be as much a measure of convenience uh, and our, and uh, the fact that we have the availability of it as anything else. Uh, certainly, I, 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 I'm more reticent to do that with an open fracture for the concern for, uh, but it, you know, if it's, if it's a fragment, uh, you know, if it's an articular surface that's uh, only tenuously supported, I, I might do it if I felt that we had gotten a very good debridement on a very, uh, you know, like a type one or a lower grade type two open, we might use that, but we're not using autograph. We're using uh, almost exclusively cancellous allograph. Uh, thank you for that. The other question is regarding the uh, fibula fixation. I could see some fantastic uh, flexible screws. <laughs> uh, yeah. How are you they know, made the, of? What are they made of? Uh, it's just stainless steel. Uh, you know, it's, uh, the, you know, so uh, the longer those are, I mean, some of those are upwards of 140, 150 millimeters. Uh, and, uh, you know, so they're flexible. The, the, I actually like those better than the, the bigger ones. And, and for the most part, you know, it's tough to get a four or five screw into anything but the, the biggest or the oldest patients. The canals just aren't big enough. Uh, you know, and, and the other thing is the four or fives are stiffer, right? So they're, they're stiffer. It's just like uh, trying to nail, uh, you know, a, a, any uh, proximal ended or asymmetric type fracture, a proximal third tibia fracture, a subtroke, or trying to put a screw down on a lecronon fracture. Uh, 
if it has to be perfect. Like if it's a stiff implant, the starting point has to be increasingly perfect, the less balanced the fragments are. It's a short end, you have to have it absolutely perfect or you're likely to kick the fracture. And you can see in at least one of them, I, I, you know, I think we did lose the reduction uh, on, on one of them, we deemed it acceptable, but uh, you know, it's, it's hard and it's nice to have uh, that somewhat flexible fixation. The thing you have to watch out for there is if you uh, are then putting a lot of force on your external fixer, you can bend uh, the fixation you've gotten within the fibula. You can do the same thing with a plating too. If you've used a one third tubular, or quarter tubular or something like that, and you put a lot of force on your um, uh, external fixator, or uh, alternatively, if you have bone loss in the tibia, uh, you try to fix your fibula because uh, it's a simpler pattern like the couple of the ones we showed, the, the, that plate can sag into varus. So we'll start to put some of the frame on. We'll put one of the tibial pins in and the calcaneal pin just to neutralize uh, the varus uh, uh, propensity of the fracture so that we can get, and, and to get a little bit of length too, right? Uh, to help facilitate fibula fixation. Thank you, Dr. Dunbar, for that. I always tell my residents to read the illustrated tips and tricks for practice surgery before going for any surgery. And what yeah. happens in very place, these guys come, we all go prepared. And finally, when we get into these, putting these wires, we find that our radiation exposure sometimes goes really high. Okay. So suddenly I, okay, let's uh, do it like normal way. So are you concerned about higher radiation exposure, especially? Uh, I, I, I guess, I guess I would have to say I should be more than I am. Uh, I, uh, so we do try not to do a lot at the beginning. Um, um, but I would say it's, uh, I think that's a legitimate concern uh, that I, uh, I probably ought to pay more attention to. We do have a pretty good, our, our newer uh, scans, our new, newer fluoroscopy uh, scan, scanners are significantly reduced than compared to the ones we had 10 to uh, uh, 14 years ago. So uh, it, it's, it's, you know, I'm not gonna say it's not a problem, but it's less of a problem. Uh, if we were still using it to the extent uh, th that uh, uh, with the, our older machines, uh, I would probably be, you know, you could probably see the radiation coming off of me. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, Dr. Dunder, thank you for that. I think that's all the questions that we have. Thank you for the fantastic presentation. And I think this is one unique opportunity where the whole world can see the beautiful work that you do at Seattle. Thank you very much for joining in. Thank you for having me.